comfortable with that, but I'm not too sure how much exposure you've had to psychosocial skills in your counselling. Do you know what psychosocial skills are? Counselling is based on Carl Rogers, um, client-centred or person-centred theory. Okay. Have you heard of any other frameworks or models that uh, psychosocial counselling may be based on? In genetic counselling? Have you come across any of them? You've heard of Carl Rogers before? Okay. So other models may be the psychodynamic model, behavioural model, the developmental model or family systems model. But the one that's most frequently used in most of the genetic counselling programs is Carl Rogers. And the importance of this model is really related to the relationship between the therapist and the client being fundamental to the healing process. And there are these three very critical elements that are incorporated into this model that define it per se. Is the volume okay? Is it working? Is it working? Is there anything I can do? So we were discussing those three aspects of that particular model and just to branch out and give you a bit more detail about them, if we look at how we apply genuineness to our counselling sessions, this is really an illustration of respect to our client. Okay? Um, how, how we portray that in counselling is by being honest about our role, uh, also honest with regards to the limitations of our knowledge and our personal feelings. So to clarify that, perhaps we can look at the situation where I'm counselling a patient and they ask me about clinical trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I haven't read the latest, so I'm not too certain if that particular exon deletion qualifies for um, exon skipping. I may then inform the patient that I'm not up to date with the knowledge. I'd like to go back and read about it and get back to them at a later stage rather than trying to get the information which I'm not certain of which may not be completely accurate. Okay, so it's about being honest and respectful with our patients or as trainee counsellors one may introduce yourself as a training or a student and elicit the help of your supervisor when needed throughout the session. Okay, that's clear? Okay, so the second aspect is unconditional positive regard. This is basically respect for the client or patient and it ensures an acceptance of the counsellee including their weaknesses, their strengths and their feelings. Okay, so even if we come across a patient who we have a very different view of a certain aspect, it's about finding the common ground or the ability to work with that individual with regards to those different feelings respect for our patient. And the third aspect is empathy. So the difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy is <coughs> feeling sympathy or um, feeling emotion for the patient because of their situation and you're wanting to comfort them. Empathy takes it one step further. It's recognizing that emotion and then going ahead and being able to put yourself in that person's shoes with regards to how they're coping, feeling, or acknowledging that um, situation. Okay, so it's the ability to look at the world through the client's eyes. All right. Um, the these elements that this model is based on allows us to establish the groundwork for more active psychosocial interventions. Okay, and if these psychosocial aspects of counselling are not addressed, then it may end up that the patient feels that their emotional issues are not relevant to the counselling process or even more of concern is that they may be too scary to address or too abnormal to be manageable in a genetic counselling session. Okay. So the importance of being able to deal with these aspects of counselling allows us to prevent the counsellor or counsellee from internalising these messages which would be detrimental to the counselling process. Okay. <coughs> so effective counselling physical attending behaviours, these are behaviours that you as a counsellor can illustrate towards the client or patient to ensure active listening is occurring. Okay. 
So in terms of what we can communicate through our, our eyes and our face, we perhaps to show interest we may have the occasional nod to our patient. We don't need to say something specifically. Um, smiling at appropriate times. So obviously when someone is crying that would not be an appropriate time to smile. Um, being able to look at our patient, so the eye contact, but also being aware of when that's something that is of discomfort to our patient. So a patient that doesn't maintain the eye contact, we might try and minimize that eye contact for them if we're sensing discomfort. Okay. Uh, in terms of our body, we want to have a relaxed but an alert posture. Um, at times, we may touch patients, but again, that's culturally sensitive. So in certain populations, that touch or gesture may emphasize that you are connecting with your patient. But in other populations, that would be something that would be culturally um, of concern to do that in that setting. Okay. Um, or handshaking, for example, in the Western population, as we greet our patient, you may shake their hand, whereas here, if it was a female, we would, but as a male, as you all are obviously aware, it's something that you wouldn't do. And that was one of the mistakes <coughs> that I made coming here as a Westerner. I tried to introduce myself to all of the males and no one wanted to shake my hand. <laughs> and finally, someone told me why. So it's important to recognize these aspects aren't universal to all counseling situations. Okay. Uh, always Try and not be disruptive. Legs and feet should be still orientated towards the client and also a comfortable distance. You don't want to be right in their face or within their space, but you also don't want to be that far that there's that separation with your client. Uh, in terms of the voice, obviously adequate volume, <coughs> um, appropriate pace, so not talking very fast or not talking too slow. That could also be disruptive. Um, Use words that match your client's sense of communication. So we try and avoid medical jargon. So let's not be using mutation when we can rather use a word that's more understandable, like change. Or perhaps um, if your client is talking about their child's special needs and you've been talking about intellectual disability, perhaps use their word in the rest of your conversation. But the reversal of this is that <laughs> if a counsel uh, counselee is using um, a word choice that may be derogatory, uh, like Mongolism, you wouldn't use their word. You would go back to using the correct term. Okay? All right? Um, and the tone and content um, should match the conversation. Distracting behaviors, filler words, you know, um, yes, it's like, okay, I find myself doing that a lot if I'm not 100% certain of the conversation I want to use or where the conversation is going. Um, however, with more confidence, you are less likely to use um, these filler words for your patients. Try planning your session before seeing the patient. So don't be going back and looking for the ECHO report for your Down syndrome case. You need to know what cardiac anomaly they do have, or if there is a cardiac anomaly <laughs> before you see your patient. It can be very distracting if you sit there looking for information, and you won't have the amount of time that you need to plan and review it um, either. Try not to play with jewelry or fidget with your hair or any fidgeting motion as well. And um, I think if we look at this picture, it's not that clear, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but this um, counselor has given this individual some bad news. Can you think of some of the behaviors that may be present in this picture before or after the delivery of the news that could illustrate positive attending behavior? <laughs> so what may she do to show that she's there for a client, that she's actively listening? Positive cues. Okay, we'll get to paraphrasing just now, but very good. Okay. Okay, so focus on her, so perhaps eye contact, okay, will be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Express that. <coughs> so in this picture, he's not able to see her, 
but it's still important for her to maintain that eye contact so that when he does come up and look, he sees her looking at her, not looking away or busy with something else while he's trying to take in this difficult news. Okay. This example, she, the contact, we could also look at the space between the counsellor and the counsellee being of appropriate distance. And we've mentioned um, the setup, so not having a desk in front of her. So we always try and be close to our patients without the barrier of a desk. So those are the type of things that we could probably pick up from this example. Okay. So our toolbox of skills and something which you've um, highlighted already, paraphrasing, is we have a number of things that we can apply to help us deal with the psychosocial aspects of counselling. And what we'll do now is just briefly go through these, because I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, and then at the end we will use an example of these and go through the practice rather than just sticking with the theory. Okay. So we have non-verbal communication, the recognition or observation of this, of these nonverbal cues, open questions, reflecting feelings, paraphrasing, and silence. Okay, these are perhaps more the most basic of the, the ways to deal with the psychosocial aspects, but it's always good to make sure that we understand these before we move on to the more advanced and the more advanced empathy. So in terms of informed consent, so if I'm a patient, gripping the sides of my chair, I may be anxious or worried, right? Based on my non-verbal um, expression of that feeling. Can you think of any other um, cases that you have had where there was a non-verbal clue to the, the emotional aspect of your patient? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you picked up on, yeah? yeah. Absolutely, they're fidgeting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, before you go on, what do you think that may reveal about them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or oh, irritated, or wanting to get information that you're delaying. Okay, fantastic, very good. You had another example. Uh -huh. Already getting news from the doctor, just on the support in the ear. Just, I want to stop to tapping, stop to be next. Like, yes. For tapping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm angry. I don't know how to stop between the conversation. So I'm angry. Uh -huh. I'm angry. Uh -huh. Just greet him. Talk with him. Then just talk something which is not related to that one. Uh -huh. Feel good. Relax. Then stop. Okay. So dealing with that, and we'll deal with these in cases, is really just observing it. Mm -hmm. At times, you may feel that that's the time to address it to highlight it to your patient that you've seen it and it may be at odds to what they're saying um, or to file it away for later, pick up on a few more nonverbal cues and then come back with a more informed um, discussion per se relating to what your thinking is going on. Okay, very good. So we have all seen a number of examples of these nonverbal cues that give us insight into our patient's feelings. All right. And most of the time we may have a very good sense, but sometimes we may be completely at odds of what they are expressing by those nonverbal cues. So the things that can help us with determining what the patient is feeling are the facial expressions. So we know that the um, majority of the patient's feelings are conveyed by facial expressions. Now, many patients are able to actually control the muscles in the face to not give us insight into what they're feeling but the eyes are one of the muscles that are not able to be controlled. So you may see someone who is angry with constricted pupils, okay, or someone with dilated pupils may be experiencing fear or anxiety. So always look at the eyes to give you an indication. You may also look at the temples for throbbing to also give you an indication of what's going on with that patient. Um, body stance. We were talking about foot tapping, what about crossed arms or leaning back, okay, those types of things again we need to be aware of. Uh, tone or volume of voice, someone angry may be talking very rapidly, very loudly um, and avoided, most importantly, avoided or deflected topics. So topics that you think may be very important to that particular session but that are never raised by the patient or if you raise them they quickly are deflected. They try and get off that topic because 
there may be an emotional concern related to that or discomfort around those issues. Okay. So those may be clues. We know that at times the verbal communication may be at odds to the non-verbal. And what would you go with at that point in time? If you're seeing someone, uh, let's take your example but alter it slightly, someone that is saying, I'm not angry, but they're <coughs> tapping their feet or they're talking loudly and rapidly, um, what would you believe, the verbal or the non-verbal? Non the non-verbal, okay, for, mo for the most part, okay. That is more likely to give you a true representation of the counsellor's feelings. If we look at the diagram, for the most part, non-verbal cues represent over half of the individual's feelings. Spoken words, less than 10%, and tone may also give us an indication of what's going on. Okay. So, it's not always very easy to communicate all the information you have to give, answer questions and be on the lookout for non-verbal cues, but it is something that gets easier with time and the more experienced you are and the more comfortable you are with the information that you're providing to the patient. But as um, beginner counsellors, the most important aspects are being able to recognise them or see them and then from then on one can start addressing them. Okay. So one of our um, tools that we can utilise are questions. Okay, we have open and closed ended. Everyone familiar with the difference between open and closed ended? Okay. So closed ended, we can't or are answered by a simple yes or no. Open ended requires more information to be passed through from the patient in response to that question. There may be questions like who, what, when, where, how, why, tell me about your experience or explain to me um, how you felt when your child was diagnosed with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. They invite a more expansive, emotionally open response from your patient. So this is a way to help us deal with the psychosocial aspects of counselling. It is useful when there's, um, you get the sense that there's an emotional element, but you're not 100% certain what it is. Okay, so someone is crying, but you're not too sure what is the upsetting news for them. Okay. And perhaps if there's no real interaction between you and the patient, it may also be used as a follow-up response to try and extract more information from them, engage with them. Any situations that you can think of where you've used open-ended questions? Okay. Okay, so when will we use a closed ended question? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or if we're planning to end the session, we don't want to <laughs> reopen a whole discussion if we know we have to be at the, with the next patient in two minutes. Okay, so there are times where we use closed ended questions. And open ended questions, perhaps, if we are interested in knowing how the mom is coping with a child with fragile X, we may use an open ended question. Or if we have a couple and the mother wants to go ahead with prenatal diagnosis and the father doesn't want to, to be able to explore that difference of opinion, we may use open-ended questions. Okay. Um, so just an extract to illustrate this, if we look at an example of closed-ended questions, do you understand the information I've just provided? If we rephrase this to be an open-ended question, what questions do you have about the information that I've provided? Or what are you thinking about the information we just went over? Or how are you feeling about the information I've just given you? Okay, so very different information can be gained from those questions. It's, it's the question asking. Okay, summarizing is slightly different. Uh, we'll get to that. But open-ended questions is the way that you ask the question, whether you're going to get a yes-no answer or more of an elaborate answer to your question. Okay. So if I ans ask you the question, what did you do today before today's lecture? You can't answer yes or no to me. Okay, it's an open-ended question because I want to know a bit more about that. Right. Reflection. Um, here we are rephrasing 
the feelings that are passed on in our client's message. Okay. Um, it involves repeating the client's statement in the form of a question to encourage further exploration of the topic. And at times we also use it to maintain the direction of the conversation if we're particularly interested in how um, that individual experienced loss in a previous situation, we want to reflect those, um, that trend of the conversation to get more information from that patient. Um, the benefits of reflection is that it helps the client feel that he or she is understood. It gives the client the opportunity to hear their own thoughts in a different way and it helps them to become aware of or acknowledge their feelings. Okay, and you may say, well, they've told us that, so obviously they know that, but for most of the time, that's not the case. Okay, and we'll put that into practice in some of our examples to see how that may be beneficial. So, um, an example of reflection in the extract is here the client is saying, I've tried to find out information about trisomy 18 and nobody's telling me what I need to know. Okay, so reflection back to the client may be, you sound frustrated and angry. So you're picking up on the feeling, the emotion that the patient has expressed and you're changing that into a question with reflection. Okay. Another example is, I'm glad we went ahead with prenatal testing. I can't wait to tell my husband the good news. We were so worried about our baby having haemophilia. And here the, the counsellor may respond, you feel really relieved because the results are negative. Okay. Everyone understand reflection? So it's identifying the emotion and then turning that back into a question. So if we use the third example and you can fill in the counsellor's response of reflection, the client says, well since my nephew was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, my husband just seems scared about another pregnancy. How would we reflect that? So what is the emotion that's been expressed here? Okay, worry? So what is, what feeling has the client expressed here? Scared. Okay, anxiety, worry. Okay, so we may respond back, so we want to use that feeling and put it into question back to our patient. So we may say, your husband seems scared. Okay, so it encourages them to talk, talk more on the topic. All right, so identify the emotion, turn it back into a question for your patient. <coughs> and then if we r respond by saying, your husband seems scared, the client may say, well, I guess we're both a little bit scared. So now we know even more. She's expressed that her husband was worried, but now we know that actually it's not just her husband, it's her. If we hadn't used reflection, we may not have been able to delve into more expression of that topic from the patient. Okay, so everyone understands reflection? Okay. All right, it's important to recognize and accurately label feelings. And again, this comes uh, more easily with time, but at times even most experienced counselors can get this wrong. But to help us um, be more accurate about it, there are a few things that we can do. Listen for those feeling words. So if we go back, the feeling words in the first example was frustration, okay, or anger. The feeling words in the second example was relief. And the third example, scared. Okay, so look out for the feeling words. Uh, watch for clues in terms of the verbal and the nonverbal. Okay? and are they at odds? Reflect those feelings back to your client and state the situation in which the feelings occurred. So it may be useful to say, it sounds like you feel angry at your husband because he's never around to help you with your child that needs all this extra attention. Okay, we're less likely to be picking up on the wrong concept if we use this way of doing it. You sound like, um, it looks like, because of this, okay? Am I making the correct deduction from what you're telling me? You're checking in with your client.
or your patient. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, things that we should really avoid is telling our patient, mm -hmm. I know exactly how you feel. Even if you've gone through exactly the same situation, your experience is different to your patient's experience. We can't ever know exactly how they feel. Okay? Also avoid, you shouldn't feel that way. And often we want to console them and say, um, because you were in a car accident just before the miscarriage, you shouldn't feel guilty. Okay? Again, we can deal with those emotions of guilt, but it's not helpful to our patient to tell them what they shouldn't or should feel, what's right or wrong in terms of how they're processing these emotions. Or everybody feels that way, again generalizing their situation, their situation is special and unique. Or nobody feels that way. Okay. So those are not very useful phrases to use in counselling. Paraphrasing, which we spoke about earlier, this is restating the same information the client has said, but in different words. Okay. And again, this just encourages the client to keep on talking about that particular topic, okay, to help you explore the psychosocial aspects. So an example may be from the client. I've just found out that my sister's baby has this genetic condition. I can't believe that my baby is at risk. I'm afraid of what the prenatal tests are going to show. If only I'd known this before I became pregnant. If we wanted to paraphrase that information, we may go, you're very worried about your baby. And then perhaps that client will go on and talk a little bit more about her worries, her concerns. What are the main things? What are her fears? How does she anticipate coping if the baby had to have this condition? Okay. So really just extracting the main element of what your patient has told you and uh, relaying that back to them. Okay, silence will be one of the last ones that we cover. It's as important as any of the other tools. And silence can often be as empathic as any words that you may use. Okay. Um, of interest is that silence shows respect to the client's story by allowing us to take in their story rather than jumping in and responding to it. <coughs> okay. It allows the clients to become aware of their feelings that they've communicated to you. It allows clients to digest what they've actually said. And often, it'll, they've never really spoken about it, so it may be one of those aha moments. This is what I'm feeling. I may not have known it consciously. Maybe I was experiencing it unconsciously up until I've actually said it. Okay? By giving them the silence, they may be able to come to that realization. And it can help clients collect their thoughts. So if they're uncertain of how to respond, they may be processing all that's going on to be able to respond back to you. If you give them that silence, they will be able to do that. If you jump in and say something in response to what you've asked, you're not giving them that ability. And usually the best length of silence that they've looked into is around 10 seconds, okay? Which may feel very long to you, but if you had to jump in before 10 seconds, usually the meaning or deeper meaning won't be expressed by the patient. Okay. And again, your own comfort with silence will depict how comfortable you are using that tool in a session. The more we use it, the more confident we are. All right. And again, after 10 seconds or after however amount of time you've left, they still haven't responded. Perhaps to encourage a response, you may use the terms similar to, it's hard to put into words what you want to say, okay? Or, what do you think about what I've just said? So you're trying to prompt them again to find out what's going on, how they're feeling, if there's anything else that they'd like to express. So we've discussed the tools, the very basic tools, and just one last concept that I wanted to touch on before we go to the practical examples is counter-transference. Have you heard about this term before? Okay. All right, so to be able to understand counter-transference, this is something um, that a counsellor needs to be aware of. Okay, it's not a tool that you use for your patients, but being aware of it allows you to deal with the psychosocial issues. So to understand counter-transference, let's first look at transference, understand that concept, and then we'll understand what counter-transference means. 
So transference is the phenomenon in which the person in treatment, so the patient or the client, redirects feelings for others onto the therapist. So what it is, is an irrational feeling or attitude that has happened in the past that is directed into the future. Okay. So I put up an example to try and clarify that for you. In this picture, there's someone who's wearing a hat and that person is particularly kind to you this morning. Okay. <coughs> this makes you feel positive and now you treat, every, uh, you treat another person with the hat kindly not because they were kind to you, but because they're wearing a hat. Okay? Is that clear? What kind of love is okay, so um, let's say that the, uh, the patient comes to you and they're so angry with you and you don't know why they're angry with you. You haven't done anything to them. You haven't said anything to them that they could be angry about. But that anger so stems from the fact that they were in a car crash. Someone rammed into the back of them on their way to the appointment. And they're now late and upset and there's a lot that they have to do because of that. So they're angry about what happened previously, not angry at you. But there's a transference of that anger onto the um, therapist because they haven't been able to deal with that anger in that situation okay they still uh, have that anger in them and the next person that they can project that onto the next person that they meet is the therapist okay so it's a, a inappropriate transfer of emotion <laughs> that's not appropriate for the situation okay now being able to recognize transference as a counselor is important because Naturally, if someone reacts to you in that way, you're going to react back, right? We often find that things that are done to us, we try and do back to others. So if someone is angry, talking loudly, frustrated, we often find that our voice goes up. We become angry ourselves. It's a defensive mechanism. So being able to recognize transference allows the counselor to remain calm, recognize that that emotion is not because of what's something that they've done, and then to calmly continue with the situation instead of reacting to it with defensive anger. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So now we understand what transference is. As counselors, it's important to be able to recognize that. But the most important aspect is this concept <coughs> of counter-transference. Okay. Now, counter-transference is the other way around. It's an unconscious attitude of the therapist towards the patient or client in response to their behavior. And it's a perception rather than the reality. So if we look at this a picture here to give us an indication of counter-transference, here the patient is telling the doctor that she had a difficult childhood. Okay? And the doctor bursts out crying, which is not really appropriate to that response, right? But actually he's crying because he had a difficult childhood and it's bringing up all those emotions in him. And he's now viewing that statement with the background of his difficult childhood. Okay. So that's clear. So transference is from the patient to the counsellor. Counter-transference is from the counsellor to the patient. Okay. And it's, as counsellors, it's about recognising these aspects. You can't always control them. They happen most of the time subconsciously, but you need to be aware of them to be able to improve your counselling. Okay. So if counter-transference occurs, okay, like as in this example, it may limit the clinical effectiveness because the doctor here is projecting his personal perception onto the client. That may not be an issue for her. Okay. That may not be why she's there for counselling. But because he had those difficulties, he's now perhaps reading into it too much. Okay. Um, it may mean, if someone is experiencing cancer transference, it may mean that they're more directive in counselling. So let's imagine um, the counsellor went for termination because she had a baby with anencephaly. Okay. Now she's seeing a patient who has just been diagnosed to carry a baby with anencephaly. 
she may be more directive in her counselling, either towards um, pushing the patient to have a termination based on her own experience, or if she had a poor experience, pushing the patient not to have a termination. Okay. So it may not be in the best interest of the patient if the counselling is based on her feelings rather than the counselling, the counsellee's perception. Okay. Um, it can lead to a loss of empathy on the part of the counsellor and it can prevent them from establishing that deeper connection um, or deeper understanding because they feel that because they've experienced it, they already know all about it. They may not ask all the relevant questions or use reflection or paraphrasing to um, dig into further detail with regards to that expression of emotion. Okay, so it's just something one needs to be aware of in your own counselling. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to use the last half an hour, um, or we'll see how far we get today. We may just tag this on to tomorrow's role play as well if we don't have enough time to practice these um, skills. So we've just very briefly gone over them and now we're going to go through them in some role plays. Okay. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, how many are we today? Two, four, six, seven, um, three, six. Uh, we, yeah, we need either nine or six. So let's, can I ask you, would you like to join us? Would that be all right? Okay. So we'll divide into groups of three. Okay. And a group of three and myself and Amira. That's it. Um, and Eamon will be a group of three and then we'll swap around. Okay. Um, one of you is going to be the counsellor. Amira, that will be you, okay? Because um, <laughs> Eamon and me don't need practice with us at this point in time. <laughs> One will be the counsellee, and the other one will be the observer. The observer, I've got a sheet here. I want you to watch your client and counsellor and make a note of the times that they use open-ended questions, silence, paraphrasing or reflection. Tick if they've used it and also write down the specific example, okay, where they used it, just very quickly. Okay. So for the first uh, case, the counsellor um, or the counsellee will be talking about the experience of this course. Okay, so as the counsellor you need to be asking them about the course and trying to use your tools within that session and just for two minutes. Okay, as the observer I want you to write down if it has been used and the example. Okay, just very briefly, you don't need to write the full sentence but just something to remind you when you give the feedback. Okay, that's clear? Okay, so we'll do the first round and then we'll see how that goes and then we'll swap over roles again. Okay, so each one will have a role as an observer, each one a role as a counsellor and each one a role as a client. Counsellee. <laughs> okay, all right. Can I switch this off? Is that fine? Yeah, I think so. I don't think we need to form the role play. <laughs> 